2001. 2001. From Cork. Uh, Cork. Oh, okay. this was C. Oh, C. Well, anyway, they were <laughs> Anyway. <laughs> but I know, I knew that it was Cork. Then I was uh, in, in Dresden, in Germany, in uh, Institute until 2004. I just say you pitched. Oh, okay, whatever, just whatever for, you to, 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 to okay. sound a little bit formal. And that was I, I won't be making ballers. And that was actually mathematics. Yeah, yeah. That's my of course, but. Right. Okay, so. And then you have been employed uh, for the first time as a professor in the uh, right state, or you had a, a fixed position in Germany before? I had no fixed position, but it was something which was related to. In other, in other countries, you would call it a non, non permanent lecturer position. Right? Okay. So we call it assistant professorship. And it, you know, the system is different. But the, the real, the, really the first, the first uh, completely independent position yes. at Wright State University started in 2000. Okay. Yeah, and something else you want me to say? Because I said that, you met, where are you now? And so, of course, you know. Maybe. I'll, I'll, say, I'll, say, I'll say a little bit about where I am, so I have that here on the slide, so I guess that, that should be it, I'll have to put it here, okay. I forgot to bring a copy, so uh, I, I think, anyway, I think okay. just uh, just keep it brief, um, okay. if I'm in the audience, you can find this introduction for me, so... I won't say. I won't speak. I won't speak five minutes. I won't. I won't say a couple of sentences, but it should yeah. still be informative. So, yeah. I, so I have I'm no. Not, I have nothing uh, on the list. Trying to, to make uh, bad jokes. And yeah. So. I mean, if you want, if you want a few no, no, highlights yeah. for the for the announcement, yeah. I can do that. So, uh, you could, you could say something like um, uh, editor of the Daily Journal or something. Like that. So, so you yeah. give me an uh, editor of. But uh, but this is. It's here. Oh, it's so. here. <laughs> I'm going to talk about Okay, so you think you're going to talk about this. Okay, just, okay. okay. read the book. Yeah, then just, then just do that. that. That's fine. Okay. Uh, 
why uh, it's going to work. I well, can you just you send me that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Probably. Yeah. 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 yeah, so I'll I just say that's my phone. That's okay. We can get that. Yeah, we can get that. Okay, no problem. sur euh, la, ce qu'on appelle la transactive memory puis collective memory donc ça va être sur la mémoire collective de la conférence qu'ils vont nous présenter donc ce sera un sujet un petit peu différent les deux dernières conférences étaient plus informatiques la prochaine sera un petit peu plus euh, philosophie des sciences cognitives donc je vous invite tous à cette prochaine conférence là et deuxième chose je m'en voudrais pas vous présenter de pas vous annoncer ou si je l'ai fait la dernière fois ceux qui étaient là vous aussi nous redire euh, notre école d'été sur la conscience notre summer school on, uh, in, on consciousness uh, uh, qui va commencer euh, le, le 30 juin, euh, le 29 juin, excusez, le 29 juin avec des conférences d'ouverture de Daniel de, 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 de Dennett, Antonio Damasio, et ensuite c'est un peu un ouzou des, des, des gens qui ont travaillé sur la conscience, autant en neurosciences qu'en psychologie, qu'en euh, qu philosophie, euh, Bob, Bob Master, euh, Bernard Vaz, euh, Philip Jackson, Joseph Lou, etc., etc. Donc vous êtes tous invités. Cette activité-là, la, la prochaine conférence, elle est gratuite. Ça, c'est une école d'été, donc c'est pas bien. Vous pouvez aller sur le site, le site de l'école d'été pour voir, et puis euh, si ça vous intéresse, je vous invite à vous inscrire. C'est une activité qui peut être créditée, soit en passant, euh, soit au niveau de la maîtrise, soit au niveau de la Voilà, il faut le doute, je vais laisser euh, être autre présenté, une conférence d'été, c'est ça. So, uh, I switch to English. This is our work in So, welcome everybody. And thank you for coming here in the Friday afternoon. I know that's was difficult to choose for a scientific presentation, especially with the nice weather that's outside. So it's my pleasure to introduce you Pascal Hitzler, Professor Hitzler, uh, who comes to us 
from not far, that far away, we would suppose. Uh, he's originally from Germany. He spent uh, his PhD time, I think, split, but Andy, uh, his PhD graduation was in Cork University in Ireland, mm -hmm. okay, in 2001. And then he worked for a couple of years in various European projects <coughs> on semantic web, although he was a mathematician, he's a mathematician, sorry, he's a mathematician, once a mathematician, oh, I think a mathematician. So he's a mathematician uh, in, in the regions. And currently he is a professor at Wright State University, well, well Wright State University, but Wayne State University. Well, in Ohio, not far from here, so it's uh, since 2009. Yeah. So Pascal is very active in the semantic uh, web community. He works on several different topics within and outside also of the, of the community, but today he'll speak of semantic web. So his presentation is about some basic problems and more advanced ones. Uh, his contributions, it's back to his contributions, very short, I would like to bore you more than that. Uh, in a couple of uh, books, so let's say monographs, monographies in English, and uh, uh, more than 100 publications in journals and international conferences. So he's involved in, in uh, uh, most of the high level uh, conferences. So I call it the conference in the semantic web area, inclusive international semantic web conference, extended semantic web conference, formal ontologies for information systems, and so on and so on. So I'll let uh, Pascal finish this uh, presentation with his own uh, needs, and so please welcome him as our speaker today. Thanks, Pat. I'm getting, <laughs> getting scared with these introductions because uh, you can only disappoint people after that. Um, it took me about four years after my PhD, and then I started no longer calling myself a mathematician. So uh, people ask me now, say I'm a computer scientist, but uh, it's still you can never can really get rid of it. And it's a peculiar situation to uh, to be a computer science professor and uh, to have say I, I, I can program and I actually never really could. I don't do prolog, but uh, who cares about prolog that much? So anyway. Um, I wanted to ask Petko and ask, ask you as well, what exactly is the timing? How long? Oh, it's about an hour. So about an hour for everything or? Uh, well, after the talk, maybe uh, an hour. Okay. After okay. okay. So this is what I just wanted to confirm. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. So my first time in Montreal, in fact, it's my first time in Canada. I'm, uh, I'm having a blast. Montreal is lovely. I mean, the part I've seen, and I can just extrapolate from that. So uh, it's, it's, it's really great, particularly if you compare it to the uh, kind of rather uh, culturally dry Midwest of the US. Right? <laughs> it's, it's, it's just a different life. So uh, this, is, this is really lovely. Um, I had a little bit too much uh, good food for lunch for uh, being completely awake. But <laughs> I also noticed that my passive French is actually better than I expected, which still doesn't mean it's very good. <laughs> so, uh, I probably won't be able to take questions in French. I certainly will not try to speak uh, to speak French because that would probably simply be funny and nothing else. So. <laughs> anyway, let's start with the talk. Um, I'm uh, I'm going to to stay on a very high level in this talk. So uh, I'm going to introduce the topic from my perspective uh, and to tell you what I think are the issues right now. To be, try to give you a high level perspective of uh, of say state of the art there. Although trying to do that is, uh, is, is, in fact, it's impossible because it's a huge field. It's about 10 years old now in earnest and uh, building on previous work, obviously. Uh, we have big conferences there. The, the International Semantic Web Conference draws about 600 or more people each year. Uh, the Extended Semantic Web Conference, uh, about three to 400, which is mainly European. There's the Semtech Conference in California going for many years now, which is mainly for target for industry with about 1,000 people each year. Uh, there's a lot of industry interest generated and so on. So it's, it's huge. And uh, one, one of the things which, uh, which I find so nice about semantic web, and probably we have a, a parallel here to cognitive science, is uh, it's a field in mainly computer science, but not only, uh, which is not primarily driven by a method, like databases, for example, or machine learning. Okay? It's driven by, by a vision. You want to solve something. You want to understand something, solve something make technological solutions for something and what the something is I'm going to tell you about. And that means it's a melting pot of very different opinions, very different methods, very different uh, 
uh, mindsets even. And I enjoyed it a lot, although it sometimes makes for very, uh, uh, very strong argumentative discussions, uh, like in panels of the big conference and so on. You really sometimes feel there's a split and these people are almost taking it personal. Uh, and I mean scientific discourse. And sometimes these days we're, we're losing the culture, so I'm, I'm happy about that. Um, in any case, a uh, little bit of self-advertising, which is a compliment of what I already said. Um, there's, uh, I, I would say there's three major so many web textbooks out there. One is where I was co-author. We won an award for this one, for which I'm, I'm really happy. Um, uh, there's a German version you might not be interested in, which actually predates this. Usually I bring a copy, and I completely forgot. <laughs> so anyway, um, the Chinese version progress, I can't read that. Um, and uh, I'm also editor-in-chief of the Semantic Web Journal, which is uh, actually only two years old, um, but already making quite a bit of, of impact in the field. So uh, uh, we're, we're trying to get on par with the established ones, and we had some new ideas there. We actually uh, using a non-standard review process, an open review process, and uh, it was a big experiment. It's working. The way we set it up, it's working. So many journals fail, and ours is working. So we're very happy about that. And um, uh, one of the things we're trying to do here is, is also uh, uh, try to be a bit more integrative. We have the feeling that, that some of the established stuff, after 10 years of many web work, uh, people focus on, well, this is what semantic web is, and the other things are not. And we're taking, trying to take a much wider view there. So I hope, which actually my, my co-editor in chief, he's actually from an application area. He's, he's a, a geoscientist. Um, so that already says that as well. Um, two more slides for self-advertising. I'm at the Ohio Center of Excellence in Knowledge and Data Computing in Dayton, Ohio. And uh, when I give a talk like this on US soil, I usually add the phrase, uh, whatever that means, it's still Ohio. Um, and then I get a lot of laughs. <laughs> okay. uh, no, I mean, uh, seriously, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's one of the main, you have to say, centers of excellence there. Uh, we have about 50 faculty. Uh, the director is Amit Chef. And uh, uh, it, is, it is an institute which, in terms of, uh, of its visibility and impact, could be at some of the big universities. You know. So I'm very happy to be part of that. Uh, and my lab currently has about uh, eight graduates and, and one undergraduate student, um, most of it NSF funding. And just as a, as a little bit of, of trivia here, um, I'm always weary about measures, about quantitative measures of research quality, right? Uh, but it's still nice if you show up high on the list somewhere. Uh, this is uh, Microsoft Academic Search. They do institutional rankings. If you look at uh, computer science worldwide web, five-year factor, we were ranked eight in January 2012. Right? And I mean, this is no this is I think we're currently uh, in, in North America. <laughs> in North America. But I mean, there's some companies out there. So I think we're six, 16 right now. It kind of varies a bit. But I mean, it shows that we're, we're uh, nobody knows the university, but uh, we managed to do some stuff. OK, I stopped the self advertising. <laughs> OK, so let's go to what I want to talk about. Um, I want to give you an idea what semantic web is about. So what, what, what is that field? What, what do we want to do there? And uh, as I already said, it's a very diverse area with a lot of people, a lot of different opinions, and quite a lot of things which I will say today are probably not shared by some others. So this is my perspective, and just keep that in mind, right, if you talk with others, and uh, it might just be the things I emphasize might be things others might de-emphasize. Uh, that's just not the, the normal thing in our field. So I'll talk a little bit about uh, why would we want the semantic web, we already have the World Wide Web, uh, what is the basic idea behind what we want to do there from my perspective. And then I talk about a recent development, meaning something which, which started happening in the last five years, which is linked data, or some people call it the web of data, which is what's currently really driving the field, or part of it anyway. And then only in the last very tiny bit, I'll give you a few high-level pointers to my own work. So I, tr I try to keep my own work as much out of this as, as I could. Uh, still, lots of my thoughts are in the, in the talk and the selection of the topics. So, World Wide Web. When I was studying, there wasn't a World Wide Web, or at least there wasn't one in Germany, in Tübingen, when I was, where I was studying. Uh, I got my first installation of LaTeX by going to the computer center, putting in a stack of uh, five and a quarter or five and a half inch uh, floppy disks. I think it was five and a quarter. 
uh, copy of this carried home, right? So I, I, I knew that. Then a few years later, we started. And we've had an enormous change since then. Just think how, how the world out there penetrates our society. A huge success on all fields. It even changes the geopolitical landscape, right? Would we have had the Arab Spring without the World Wide Web, right? We probably wouldn't, or at least not in that form. Yeah? Um, lots of commerce is happening there. Um, people use it not only for work, they use it for their free time, right? It per penetrates our Western society. <coughs> and just think back, end of the 80s, what was the world like that then? It was a software release. Somebody, Sir Tim Berners-Lee, but in the meantime, Sir, uh, he wrote a piece of code uh, while he was at CERN in, uh, in, in Switzerland, and it was a software release called World Wide Web. Okay, and then it spread. And then it became, we, this day we would say it went viral, right? The first thing which went viral on the web was the web itself, right? The, the whole idea of it. Well, it went viral on the internet, which was there first. And with World Wide Web, we mean what you do with the browser, right? Email is usually not what you would call World Wide Web. So, uh, and what we have there now is we have huge amounts of data, we have huge amounts of information and knowledge. Um, uh, when I was uh, about 20, my mother bought a big encyclopedia and a couple of years later, you could throw it away. Okay, everything's out there on the web. Uh, now, one thing about this, however, is that the content provided on the World Wide Web is made for human consumption. It's made for us. We go there, we read the information. Computers can shuffle the information around, bring it wherever it should be. Computers can deal with some of the information if a programmer uh, wrote exactly what's supposed to be done with the information. But the information presented, the, the knowledge on the web, is really made for human consumption. And this is where semantic web comes in. This is where the semantic web idea comes in. Uh, just a little screenshot. This is, uh, so 92 was the really this is uh, the, first, the first web browser developed by Tim Berners on, on the next uh, station, in fact. <clears throat> so, um, the World Wide Web, 19, I think 1989, the release came a bit later. And then um, uh, this idea that the information on the web <coughs> uh, would, in the ideal case, not only be available for human consumption, but also for, let's say, intelligent processing by computers. Okay, and we'll see some examples later. This idea is actually not new. This whole hype about this, the main web hype, started in about 2001 with the Scientific American article, which Tim Berners Lee wrote with some other people. But the idea of doing this in a machine, accessible machine crossable way, actually was there from the very beginning. And uh, so I, I haven't read it, but I heard that in, in the earlier early writings by Tim Berners Lee, the ideas were already present. It's just that they had to learn how to walk before they could start to run. So that it took much longer. Um, and in the, in the 90s, there was already an activity by the World Web Consortium, which is the, the standardization body for everything worldwide web. They make the languages for visualization of the web browser, etc. Uh, the director is Tim Berners-Lee, uh, obviously, I would say. Uh, in the 90s, there was something which was called the metadata activity. Metadata, the idea of metadata is that it's data which describes other data with the intention of giving meaning to the data. Semantics, meaning to the data. Now, obviously, uh, uh, it needs to be explained how this is meant. Okay, what is, what is meaning? What is semantics? Uh, well, we'll come to the specific perspective which parts of the semantic web community have on it. What I want to say is it's old. And in 2001, the idea is old to do this on the web. Um, 2001, there was a, uh, a, a so-called semantic web activity chartered. Then there was a Scientific American article. And there was initial funding uh, by the DARPA in the double program. And then the European Union jumped on board and just pumped money into it. And what we have right now is that uh, Europe is clearly leading in everything having to do with scientific research on semantic web topics. Uh, although we have to say that industrial uptake is better in the US. Uh, it's probably the, the thing, the way things usually go. You can think something up and the merits big money. Uh, so, and we're seeing a big change these days. In the last few years, we're seeing a big change. In fact, uh, it, I remember, I started working on Semantic Web in about 2004, and uh, I would say about 2006, um, 
there was a big disappointment spreading in the community because one had kind of five, six, seven years of big EU funding and industry uptake was lagging. So it was just, it was just not happening. And uh, I know that we discussed at that time with some people whether to essentially jump ship, what's our next topic? So let's forget some of let's do the next thing. Uh, and since then, since about 2006, things have really changed. And then the uptake started. And just in the last year, things have happened where you say, well, it, it has finally arrived. Finally arrived. I'll give you three examples. This here is a, um, uh, a screenshot from Wall Street Journal. This was uh, a story which came out 15th of March this year. Um, and essentially, the story they broke here, which I believe still remains to be confirmed by Google, but their story was Google is going semantic. Their story was that uh, Google is working on overhauling their search approach. Now, you have to realize what that means, right? Google has been living almost <laughs> exclusively from their patented search and page ranking algorithm, right? So if even only half of this is true, it means that some people are smelling that something needs to change. Okay? So this is one, just one example here. Uh, and yes, they bought free baits, for example, a couple of years ago, right? which points in that direction. Uh, yeah. Here's another example. <coughs> Who knows IBM Watson, Jeopardy? Yeah, OK, so you, you heard about this, uh, or you, you've seen it. Uh, this game show Jeopardy, where people get very convoluted descriptions of, of things and then they have to find out what the answer is. Uh, very mind boggling. And then IBM set out a couple of years ago uh, in, a, in a very well concealed and secret project and said, We're going to beat the humans with this. It's kind of, and the, the, the challenge and, uh, of this was, I would say, comparable to what they did with Deep Blue in the 90s. Yeah? So I, for me, this is the next milestone in AI, one of the next, one of the milestones. And I, I think if 10 years will think about this in a similar way, Deep Blue uh, was a few 10 years ago. And they not only beat the humans, they actually did beat them by an order of magnitude. Okay? Uh, so this is a question answering. It's certainly a very specialized setting. It's like a game setting, right? right? Like chess. But still, in fact, what one has to say is that Last year, when they did that, it, it was no longer really a surprise uh, to many people that this is now possible. The really amazing thing is that they believed that already a couple of years ago when they started the project. Okay? When they noticed, OK, the time is right to really do this. And if you look at, uh, at, the, at the team and the top of the people, there are some semantic webbers in the team. Uh, there are there's some semantic webbers in key positions. And yes, they use semantic web technology as part of the system. Obviously, they're using a lot of stuff. They're using a lot of information retrieval and all these other stuff. But yes, they use semantic technologies. They use linked data as well, to a certain extent. Uh, I'm going to talk about linked data uh, later. So, third example. Siri. Right? Siri. Uh, Siri used to be not, not, a, not a, 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 an app on the iPhone. It used to be a company called Siri. Um, and the guy who was running it was, uh, was Tom Gruber. Uh, Tom Gruber be a semantic webber of the first hour. And a couple of years later, uh, Siri was bought by Apple. That's the newscast here. And then now we have Siri on the iPhone. Okay. So uh, right, semantic web technologies in the system. And people don't even notice. This is, um, I. I I'm aware that all that, that, that it's kind of statistics are always a bit difficult, uh, but, uh, but still, I mean, it's nice to see this. Indeed.com is a job search engine which integrates information from many other job search engines. So you can do a meta search for, for job postings. And uh, what they also provide is you can, you can they call it a trend analysis. Uh, so you put in some description, and they show you how the number of jobs uh, which would be returns to the search uh, actually have developed over the years, right? So that you grab, yeah. Now notice this is not absolute numbers; it's percentage growth, okay? But still, there's a trend here, okay? And the trend is pretty clear. Um, <clears throat> I got this out. I found this by 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 chance. Uh, 
This is a Gartner hype cycle. Um, actually from 2006. But this is why I found this so nice when I found this two years ago. Just looking back on this. And um, uh, I think that was the last time that semantic web stuff actually appeared on the Gartner hype cycle. Uh, and then it was gone afterwards. And you have public semantic web here at the depth of the depression, which was just what I actually told you that that was, right? You have corporate semantic web up there, right? Which I believe a year later was almost gone from public talking about it. And both are labeled in 2006 with five to 10 years to mainstream adoption. And uh, then I thought, okay, it's probably not just hot air what they're producing. <laughs> so that was rather amazing. Okay, so um, let's, uh, let's try to start understanding what the issues are with doing intelligent processing with, with web information, which is essentially what we want to do. Uh, and let me do that by starting with a, a, a very nice web page which is called Google a Day. Uh, if you want to go there and experiment with that, it's, it's actually fun to do. So it has, it has I believe, nothing to do with semantic web, but it shows uh, the problems we want to solve. Uh, and uh, as you often have it, it, uh, it includes things where people are extremely good with, but we have no idea how to automatize them. Okay? This is, uh, when you're cognitive scientists, you know what I'm talking about. So, um, if you go to a Google a day, then you get a normal Google interface, and down here you get a second frame with a question. It's each day a different question. And the questions, this is one example for a question. If you key in international dialing code 40, how would you say good morning in the language of the country you're calling? And uh, we're so used to dealing with Google and other syntactic search engines, we know how to do this stuff. Okay? The reason we know how to solve this doing Google search is because we know how, how Google search functions. It's not because it's, it's particularly good in, in dealing with us, right? We're good at dealing with it. Uh, so, how do you solve that? Uh, essentially, well, you get the feeling there's a couple of key information I need to pick up from different websites, and then I have my answer, right? And we are extremely good in planning this. Uh, it's kind of immediately clear to us what we need to do. Um, we need to uh, look for international country code 40. <coughs> we don't even need to follow the, the link because the, that it's Romania is actually there. And then uh, uh, we search for an English to Romanian translation. We get a, a link to a website. We go to this website, type in good morning, get our answer. Okay. Um, it's a different question whether we trust this answer, right? The nice thing with the Google data is you can actually enter the answer and tell us, yeah, that's correct. This is fine, right? Now, we've, we've done something very astonishing right now. Uh, and again, you're the cognitive scientist, so you know that. Yeah? How do you automatize this stuff? Right? How, do we, how do we make it possible for computers to automatize that? Mm. And one of the key questions here you can ask is, what kind of background knowledge do we actually need to solve this? Yeah? What, is, what are all the things you need to know to be able to do this? Right? And uh, do, can we get any handle on formalizing at least part of it such that we can solve some of these things automatically? And I'm not talking about solving all of them automatically, because one thing semantic web is scientifically not trying to do is solve the general AI problem. Right? We're not trying to do this. We're trying to make some steps in improving things like automatic information integration. Okay? And every step we manage in doing that is going to help us. Because a typical company information engineer, I have been told by people who know more about this, uh, spends an overwhelming majority of his time searching for information about which he knows needs to be somewhere, but he just can't figure out where it actually was. Okay? So, um, computers can't do that. Yeah? Because they they don't understand this stuff. It looks all Chinese. Okay. Can anybody read that? No, no Chinese. Here. Okay. So, uh, who's the president of the United States? And this is Barack Obama. Um, I can't read Chinese, but I have a Chinese PhD student, so I told you that. So, <clears throat> um, how can we hope to solve some of these things? And uh, one thing that uh, that needs to be clear is. Uh, it's this idea which is driving the field. And everything coming 
from here in my talk, which I present in terms of these are the methods which are current semantic networks, web methods, they simply came into existence because, okay, it seemed the way forward for the community. Okay? Now, uh, if you have alternative ways of solving all this stuff, then that's cool, right? So it's not about the methods, it's about the challenges. So, what is the, there's, there's a picture we see out there. Oh, okay, I deleted it. There, there should be a second person here. I don't know where this where is. Uh, so, if two people communicate, then uh, uh, well, they exchange symbols or, or wavelengths or whatever, whatever code it might be. So one person might say to the other Jaguar, and for some miraculous reason, the other person understands what the previous person was actually talking about. And uh, what actually, what happens from a certain perspective here? There is another picture missing, right? Down here, show you a car there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so, um, uh, but actually, well, one way of looking, a primitive way of looking at this, a primitive way of looking at this is uh, uh, the, the meaning, the co there is a context in which this communication falls, and the context disambiguates and explains, because for some reason there are two agents, and they both have uh, uh, probably not completely aligned knowledge, of, uh, knowledge and model of reality, and for some reason, they inter uh, overlap to a significant extent that somehow they can get the context and the information into their heads and somehow figure out what the other person means, namely whether it's an animal or a car. Okay. We don't know how to do this with computers. Uh, although you guys are working on being cognitive scientists. Okay. Uh, but we're still some, some steps ahead. Now, what we certainly do not know in a sense that we could make, uh, hope to make any industrial strength solutions right now is how to generate this context on the fly, or how to get all this knowledge uh, completely into systems which we could automate. So we're taking shortcuts. We're taking shortcuts. And the shortcut which the Semenuer community has come, come up with is, well, we need some background knowledge to solve our problems. And such a piece or collection of background knowledge uh, they made up a new word for it. It used to be called knowledge base, and now they call it ontology. Uh, okay, that's the way things go. Um, and this ontology gives background knowledge to, well, some task which is supposed to be solved. And now the connection between the information items which are exchanged between the computers are explicitly linked to the background knowledge. They're annotated. And this way, and that's the idea, you provide a context to pieces of information which are exchanged. And that way, we provide meaning to the image. OK, so that's a straightforward idea. And uh, so the other perspective, we have metadata to the data, data which explains the data. And now the problems start. Okay, very nice idea. Uh, so you have a background ontology, you have information, say about scientific papers, and um, say your, your background knowledge talks about different aspects of publications, uh, uh, title, author, event, etc. And then you make your links, you annotate your data. Uh, this is the title, this is, these are the authors, the whole thing is a publication, and so on. Um, and then the idea is you do this for all your knowledge on the web somewhere, and then you get an integrated space which you can use deductive methods, for example, for querying that and getting your answers. Okay, sounds good enough. Uh, in practice, things are actually much harder. But uh, before I come to that, um, let's just uh, um, dwell for a, a second on the notion of semantics here. Uh, although I feel almost like, like carrying all to uh, Oxford, uh, if you get the, get the joke. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll start. Um, so, what, where do we get the semantics into the system? Where do we get the semantics into the system? Um, in a sense, we we're have these ontologies, we have these knowledge bases, and these knowledge bases, well, it's just more data, okay? It's background knowledge, right? So, somehow we need to get the semantics into the picture. We need to get meaning into the picture, which is computationally accessible. We are not going to try to solve the grounding problem. We are not going to do this. Okay? But somehow we need to find a shareable semantics, a declarative semantics, preferably 
meaning one which is not dependent on specific algorithms which are difficult to fizzle out and verify. So the declarative. We need to uh, particularly have a semantics which is computable. Right? How do you compute meaning? Yeah? And uh, the answer is uh, what some people would call inferential semantics. Or in other words, we go back to these thousands of year old concept of formal logic, Aristotle, and then later on, obviously, the more expressive stuff is predicate logic. We go back to this, and we use this very old, and I'd say philosophically also uh, reasonably well-founded approach of inferential semantics, which means that um, the semantics, which needs to be computable, is a mathematical entity. Okay? For it to be computable, we need it to be a mathematical entity. For being declarative and shareable, very well defined. And the mathematical entity in this case is, in fact, a relation, the so-called logical consequence relation. The logical consequence relation uh, is something which tells us what are the logical consequences of a set of pieces of knowledge. Okay? And this relation, this logical consequence relation, the basis of deductive reasoning, this actually uh, provides the meaning in our context. Um, <clears throat> so, and this is, this is the same thing in other words. That means we attempt to provide the meaning to information, not by directly specifying the meaning. We don't know how to, how to ground stuff. We can't do that. But what we can specify is we can specify how information interacts with other information. The consequences of bringing pieces of information together, meaning in Aristotle's words, right, understanding which other things follow by necessity from a given set of knowledge. Okay? Uh, we describe meaning indirectly through its effects. And this is what makes complete sense to me. And uh, I don't think that logic is is the answer to the general AI problem, right? Or to the problems cognitive scientists are interested in. But we don't really have a good alternative yet. Okay? We don't really have a good alternative. We have some other alternatives which also solve some partial problems. You can do stuff with neural networks, you can do with logic, obviously. You can solve some tasks. Yeah? But uh, as soon as we have to deal with with discrete knowledge, with knowledge which you can actually model and code and deal with and understand, also on a human level, uh, level we don't really have alternatives. Okay. Despite all the shortcomings of, uh, of formal logic. Um, so, and what you can do then is you can do logical reasoning. Um, if I ask for cities, I also want all capitals listed. Okay? Even though previously they were not listed in capital simply because I have a piece of background knowledge which says uh, all cities are ca all capitals are cities. Okay. So um, <coughs> all this inheritance reason. And this this simple example, uh, now now I'm going back to an application, a real application. Uh, this is actually what I remember from a keynote talk by Evan Sundhaus at the International Semeni Web Conference 2010. I need to check the time just to make sure. Okay. Um, by Evan Sandhaus. He is, uh, uh, I, I think, uh, something like the chief scientific officer of NewYorkTimes.com. Uh, and NewYorkTimes.com went semantic a few years ago, which means um, if you go there, you don't notice. But they power their website using ontology languages. Um, and uh, he gave this keynote and talked about a problem they had um, in doing so. And the problem was the following. Um, say they, they have news from Rome, and they know Rome is located in Italy. Um, well, they, they have news from Rome, that's what he started with. And now the problem is people might be interested not in news from Rome, but in news from Italy. So for some reason, for, for this reason, they actually need to somehow make sure that news from Rome is also found if people actually look for news from Italy. Now, in this single case, that's clear enough, but you have so many cities around the world, what are you going to do? And then they went to what's linked data. Linked data is some knowledge which is already out there in ontology languages on the web. I'm going to come to this. Uh, they went out there and found their linked data databases, which just gave relationships between which cities are in which countries. So they had the information there. 
And then they could use this information, just materialize out their new knowledge here, pop it into the background database, and whoop, people found the new pieces of knowledge uh, once they said, well, loosely to me. I'm not sure he was aware of what he was doing was reasoning. But I mean, that's reasoning. Okay? It is deductive reasoning in a very simple case. So, uh, back to this here. So, um, uh, just to, to, to close the loop to a Google a day. Um, these things here all have to do with integrating information from different websites. If you would uh, assume that websites would provide their information in a readable, in a, a, a parsable way, not just text, but in a way in which you can actually read it into, into a knowledge base, and you had a few pieces of background knowledge which are just suited to your problem domain, Right? then this looks achievable. This looks doable. Okay? At least for, for, uh, for some of these examples. I have to speed up a, a tiny little bit. Um, so what happened uh, in terms of semantic web and community development was that in 2004, the World Web Consortium made two recommendations. They call their standards recommendations, uh, kind of trying to downplay things a bit. And these two rec uh, recommendations were two uh, ontology languages, well, RDF is probably more a metadata representation language, and OWL is really a full-blown knowledge-based representation language. And both of these have in their formal specification a model theoretic semantics, meaning and inferential semantics, which can actually be implemented. So people know how to implement reasons, which can be deductive reasoning. So it's there, it's there. OWL 2, uh, there was an update to OWL 2009, and RDF is being updated as we speak. Uh, and one of the things I'm, uh, I'm primarily doing right now in terms of research is I explore the space of ontology languages. So there's two there already, RDF and OWL. So why do we have two? Then we have more, just others are not really standardized or were standardized later. Why do we have these different ones? Because there is a trade-off between expressivity and scalability, and also ease of use, I would say. The problem you have is that um, if you have a knowledge representation language in which you can say a lot of very complicated things, then the deductive reasoning algorithms are extremely expensive. And I'm talking extremely expensive, right? Uh, in terms of computational complexity theory, you would be happy if they were only in p-complete. Okay? They're actually much worse. They're double, double non-deterministic exponential, these kind of stuff. Uh, so on the other hand, if you want to do deductive reasoning very quickly, you have to use a small language, in which you cannot say that much, but it might still be useful for certain purposes. And exploring this space, this continuum, is one of the things I'm, I'm doing in research, and uh, also understanding how different ontology languages actually relate to each other, how we can algorithmize this thing, and so on. But I'm not going to bother you uh, with, with the details here, um, which are often, often really made interesting for logicians. Um, so, because everybody who wants to apply, right, they just want a black box which can do the reason. So, okay, uh, an example for what we mean with ontology. Uh, there, I introduced this idea by essentially saying an ontology is a knowledge base. And I think this is the correct conceptual perspective. However, uh, the semantic web community has come up with certain uh, patterns they like to use when doing ontology modeling. And uh, that is also helpful because that means the simple languages can, can focus on, on the simple things and then the, the bigger ones can enrich them and we get really a continuum of languages. <laughs> Essentially, you could think of simple ontologies as uh, taxonomies on steroids. That would probably be the perspective. So usually, ontologies start with a taxonomy which might go into a class hierarchy if you have multiple inheritance. Uh, and then from this class hierarchy, you might start adding individuals, things you actually talk about, which in that context would be URIs or web resources. Uh, and then you might add some binary relationships, which might have domain and range declarations, for example. And uh, once you have this, and then also inheritance between these binary relationships, then you already have to have something which is called RDF schema. It's essentially the language. In terms of knowledge representation language, it's extremely poor. Okay? Uh, but still, it already helps. You can solve Evan Santos your kinds of comp problems, for example. Uh, and then the fun starts here because, uh, in particular, then if you talk with uh, with with 
uh, people coming from applications and ask them, so what do you need in terms of representation capabilities? And you usually get these things where nobody knows how to deal with them efficiently. And they start talking about, but I actually need to deal with probabilities, right? <laughs> I need to deal with default knowledge and all these kind of things. Extremely tough, right? But uh, you can start enhancing this stuff. If you know about logic, then you know you can represent what I just said in a very small fragment of first order predicate logic. Again, you can just enhance with whatever knowledge of capabilities you need, as long as, well, you find a way to deal with it reasonably and you have a critical mass of people who are actually interested. Okay. Um, so, this is our idea of schema. Our goes a bigger step towards first order predicate logic, but it's still not completely there. First order predicate logic is much too powerful for what we currently know how to deal with. So, we're not going the full way. Okay, so now what was this, the new thing then? Uh, the new thing happening in about 2006, um, when, when the community was, was essentially at the trough of the depression. Um, and uh, what came was a new idea, a, a very simple idea, but a new idea and one which proved to be extremely powerful. And the idea was, well, you could say, it was probably the obvious thing to do. Uh, essentially, uh, well, you talk about all this stuff. Start putting your data on the web. That was the idea, right? So stop doing, stop writing papers. Put your data on the web. And then what essentially started was a grassroots effort by researchers and then some companies joining, some, some government agencies and so on. And they just started to take their data and put it out as very simple ontology. In fact, in most cases, you don't even have the class hierarchies. You only have individual property, individual triples. Right? Things like Rome located in Italy and these kinds of things. But that started in 2006. And uh, they set up, this is actually something Tim Berners-Lee himself turned up, uh, only four constraints which something needs to satisfy such that they call it linked data. This is the idea about putting this data out. Linked data. Put this data out. Uh, use your eyes and your things. Um, these are resource, web resource identifiers. Furthermore, um, use a special type of URIs which can actually be looked up using a web browser. Third, uh, provide useful information at in this location. And fourth, make sure that the stuff you put out on the web actually includes links to other data sets which other people have been developing. And if you do this, you create link data. Right? Use standards, RDF. Sparkle is a query language, RDF is just this very, very simple uh, knowledge representation language. And uh, then uh, somebody came up with the clever idea of, of visualizing link data. And uh, that was the first picture they produced in 2007, May 2007. Looks kind of funny, right? This is, this is pretty small, so I mean, uh, what was happening there? Uh, still, already you see in the center DBpedia. DBpedia is, is a data set which uh, essentially does nothing else than collect the information from Wikipedia info boxes. So it takes Wikipedia pages, and since this is text, how do you convert text? That's a completely different problem, right? So they don't do it. But Wikipedia has these info boxes on the side, uh, which, which does, uh, they give the information. But well, if you enter the information, you use a form for entering the information. So it is already structured in Wikipedia, so it's easy to export in a structured format, okay, as logical statements. So that's Wikipedia. And it's, uh, since it it's covers so many topical domains, it's probably a very good thing to link to if you do something. Uh, music rates, this is actually not actually company. They were on board very, very, very so information about music. US Census data was pretty early. Friend of a friend was still comparatively big at that stage. At that, that, that stage. And then uh, this is 2008. Oh, it's 2007. It's half a year later. Okay? And if you now uh, keep looking at this uh, 2008, 2009, 2010, 2011, then you already get the feeling, whoops, this looks exponential, right? I mean, roughly the number of data sets doubles each year up to now. This is the latest thing we have. Um, and uh, this is color showing different thematic domains. And each of these blocks, somebody was there actually doing the stuff, providing the stuff for the community. Some of these are very, very large. Some of them have uh, millions of, of axioms, okay? 
Up here is life sciences. The life science people were one of the early adopters. They're very interested in, in uh, empowering their research and their research communities with shareable data. So they were uh, very early there in the space. This up here somewhere is the scientific publications. Um, over here is, uh, is, is governmental data, US census, and these kind of things. Um, and uh, right, so <coughs> currently, last count, uh, which was um, in, in September 2011, we're talking about 31 million triples. Uh, sorry, billion. 31 billion triples. And we're probably, it would be fair to say that we're probably at 50 now or something like this. Uh, next question, what to do with this stuff? <laughs> okay, it was a grassroots effort just producing the data. They were essentially producing the data, hoping somebody would be able to do something useful with it. Uh, believing the semantic web promises that, that you can actually do it, right? Um, and it turns out it's not that easy, right? There are some pockets with applications like New York Times.com, they took the information from Link Data to run their little script. Uh, probably not terribly exciting, right? But for them, it was extremely, extremely valuable, right? It's probably not getting a good return of investment. Uh, so the next big step here is now we have the Link Data hype. Now that we will soon have the big data hype, you know, which is more encompassing, but contains this as well. And I believe for the data, the next point is they need to show it's useful on a much bigger scale. Okay? There is a widespread belief that it is, but it's currently not clear whether it's hype or substantial. And then the problems start <coughs> when you try to look into this. Uh, well, IBM Watson was using link data. Okay? But IBM Watson was, I don't know, 30 or 50 people working on this stuff for five years. So they could do a lot of cleaning up and profiling and whatever, right? That's not what we want for the semantic web. We want stuff which is, which is much more immediately useful. If you look into these uh, linked data files, then you notice that sometimes they're rather peculiar. Uh, there's always good reasons for this, uh, but it doesn't make them, make them immediately useful in, in a naive sense. This here is, uh, is some information about geonames. And um, uh, what they do here is uh, they have some rather funny shortcuts which they use to abbreviate certain types of places. So they would say that some geographical location has a feature, and the feature would be something like p.ppll. Uh, and then for the initiated, that would mean it's a populated locality, right? And then you have things like up there is a populated place, and that, uh, down here is a religious populated place. Uh, but the knowledge, the semantics, that they are actually related, because a religious populated place is a populated place, it's not modeled. Right? You could model it, it's easy. We have, the, we have it in RDF schema, but it's just not modeled, okay? for, for whatever reason. Um, but that, that's, that's not that much of a problem. Uh, the other problem is, in my opinion, that uh, while this is the idea I, I, I put forth for semantic web information integration, namely the schema node here in the middle. Uh, most of linked data is actually uh, schemaless. I wrote a workshop paper called Linked Data is Merely More Data, uh, which got a lot of praise and a lot of beating. <laughs> yeah. And about 35 citations for a workshop paper is pretty good. So, uh, uh, there's a, a significant number of people who believe that if we want to deal with these kind of issues, or hope to, we will need schema knowledge. Okay? Uh, there's a, so it's a big discussion in the community right now. Here's another problem with linked data, um, just as it is right now. And I'm, not, I'm not trying to trash linked data. Okay? It's cool. It's cool, but it's, it's only the first step. Uh, so you have, in, 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 essentially in RDF, you only have binary predicates, okay? Um, so you would have something like, this is a URI, has name Nancy Pelosi being a string. Okay, this is a triple, so-called triple, a, a simple RDF string. Now, in order to uh, represent more complicated knowledge, um, well, you cannot express everything with binary predicates, so you have to find some workarounds and more complicated things. And in particular, if you create your knowledge, say, from a database, 
then uh, the way the stuff is represented in the database is not necessarily something in a way in which you would find it intuitive. Yeah? So for example, um, in GovTrack, they certainly make the laudable attempt of just mirroring the complicated bureaucratic processes of governmental dealings, right? which results in the fact that a simple statement such as Nancy Pelosi voted in favor of the healthcare bill uh, ends up to be a couple of triples uh, which look roughly like this in a graph representation. Okay? Here's Nancy Pelosi, uh, sorry, here's the bill, here's the title, there's Nancy Pelosi, and there's how she voted. Okay? Uh, now, try to use this stuff. That means if you want to use this stuff, you actually have to dig into the data sets and understand them to such a deep amount that you're actually wondering if there is already meaning in the picture, semantics in the data set, if in the end you have to figure it out in your head and in your head. Anyway. Okay, so these are the things we need to deal with. Uh, another example. I think I have 10 minutes, let me start late. Yeah. Is that correct? Okay. So, uh, another example, just the very same thing. Um, say you want to identify Congress members who voted no on pro environmental legislation passed four years with high pollution industry in their congressional districts. In principle, all this information is in linked data. It's all there somewhere. First problem, where? Right? Uh, where is the data? It's in different data sets. Now, how am I going to know? Where, where do I need to look up the information? Uh, I need, to, I need to have infrastructure for doing this, or intelligent methods for doing that. We're talking about 50 billion triples, and it's exponentially rising. Right? <coughs> so, problem. Um, uh, high pollution industry, there is no high pollution industry. There. We're going to need some background knowledge, because high pollution industry is not modeled anywhere. But we might have things like coal plants. Okay? So we need some background knowledge. What do we need in terms of background knowledge? Um, what is environmental legislation? We get the abstracts of the bills. Oh, shoot, we're back to tax process. Okay. Um, in the congressional district, spatial reasoning, right? Temporal reasoning, etc. We're In a sense, we're back to all the old AI problems. We are a step closer. Okay? We understood a lot of things. We have more powerful algorithms. We have more powerful computers. We have an AI researcher's dream of 20 years ago, namely we have huge amounts of data at everybody's disposal, so we should be able to do something there. But uh, I think it's, it's, it's not right to say we're almost there. Right? There's still a lot of work to do. So, um, how can we get there? How can we get there? And uh, I want to end this uh, talk with just giving you a high-level glimpse of one approach which we're trying to do here for querying linked data. And uh, this approach is actually based on a much more general consideration how I think in the moment information on the web of data, on the semantic web, could or should be structured. Traditional web content, okay? Human eyes only, right? Unless you have a really powerful text processing system. Uh, then obviously you can lift it, but you would have to lift it first. Link data. Uh, we need to understand that this data is messy. It's still messy data. It's not something you can use immediately. And then on top of that, we need schema data. Schema data, which actually models parts of the world. And now we need to be careful, because we learned from the site pro project of 20 years ago that we cannot make schema knowledge which spans all the human knowledge. Right? And I would even go a step further and say, even if we do what so many web people usually do, and we say, if you make your ontology, only model the domain which is currently of interest to you. This is one step. I would even go further. Model your ontology not only on the domain which interests you, but model it only for the specific purpose you want to use it for. So, I'm not making schema knowledge for new entertainment information on linked data. I'm making schema information for whatever I want to do with this information. And if I want to query this information for query answering, I might end up with probably having a different schema knowledge than if I do it for, I don't know, information, general information integration. Uh, or for uh, uh, well, helping an intelligent software agent to do my shopping for me. Right? 
So, schema driven by specific application type or specific application. And uh, what's currently not happening, regretfully, on the on the on on the data and on the Cementi web is that these layers are not separated, and I believe they should be separated. People just make the data, they put a little bit of schema knowledge into it, they put a lot of equality relationships between entities into it. That's the usual links between different linked data sets. They say Barcelona and Wikipedia is the same as Barcelona and Freebase. But if you look it up, then they're actually Barcelona from very different perspectives, different population counts, then one might think of the political entity, the other one of the cultural entity, whatever, right? And they just they put something in there which is called all same as, which essentially says with a strong ontological commitment, they're the same, right? They're not. This belongs here actually strongly committing information. Okay, now following this approach, how are we doing our reasoning, uh, our query answering? Uh, this is the high level perspective of the approach we're following. Um, here are the lead data sets. And here's our schema. And for the schema, we, we reuse some existing so-called upper level ontologies. There are ontologies which, which uh, cover in a relatively shallow way broad areas of knowledge, try to structure it in some way. And there are some around of different uh, quality, different variety, doesn't matter. In such a way that our query, for proposing the query, we only need to understand the upper level of the We don't need to understand the message structures down there. And then our system would break the question up into sub-questions, which go to the different data sets from which we get responses to the partial questions and then they are reassembled in the upper level ontology to give the answer. Uh, this is a vanilla old school semantic web information integration approach, right? There's nothing exciting about this from that perspective. It's exciting if you start looking at the problems you're getting there. So, sorry, previous slide. Um, one of the problems is how on earth are you going to relate those two data sets, right? Uh, manually, that's not scalable. Okay? We need automatic methods for aligning these ontologies. That's a technical term which is used there. Uh, and it would probably be enough if, if there is some schema in here, if we can align the schema with this. And the ground facts can then follow from that. Uh, ontology alignment is, is, a, is a topic studied for, don't know, 10 years in semantic web and before that uh, for other domains. So we thought, let's just use one of their tools. It will do it for us. Turned out it didn't. Um, just turns out that, ignore the last part, that some of the most powerful tools had actually very bad performance on linked data for whatever reason. Okay? There are reasons for that, but you can't discuss this all here. Um, we're talking about precision recall values like uh, 0.7 to 0.43. Precision means uh, to what, how many in percentage of the answers are correct and recall means how many of the correct answers are actually found. Okay? And with values like this, it's very difficult. Right? So first thing we had to do is we had to develop our own ontology alignment system uh, which can do better. Right? I think we're more at 60% now. But at least we're in an order of magnitude that can work with it. And, uh, I mean, essentially, this system will now fill a PhD thesis. Okay, so this is a PhD thesis work, just solving this one little subproblem of the thing. Uh, however, once we have that, we can start trying to solve our query answering problem. You ask a question. This is a question in a in a query format called Sparkle. Don't worry about uh, the syntax if you don't need know it. Uh, it is formulated only in terms of an upper level ontology called Proton. And then the system um, <coughs> would use the alignment mappings between this upper level ontology and the, and the, the domain ontologies uh, to break the question, the query down into two sub-queries which are opposed to different data sets. And you know where to put it because you have the mapping, which can actually guide where it's supposed to be put. It retrieves the answers from the different data sets. And then there's one step missing, 
you have to reassemble the information in the upper level, back to the upper level ontology. So I'm not going to bother you with details here. Um, it works, right? It works to the extent to which it works. We can use the automatic alignments which, for which we now have a system to a certain extent. There are other types of alignments which you also need to use. We don't have complete solutions for those yet, so we're working on that. Um, for example, we also need an alignment for properties. Right now we have alignments only for classes, uh, but we need it for the binary predicates as well. Uh, so right now for our querying approach, we're using some reference alignments which you could find for the, for the properties. Uh, but to the extent that, um, that uh, we have the technology right now, the, the approach works. Right? And uh, the more we can put automatically created schema knowledge into the picture, the better it gets. So let me get our answers. Uh, as we requested earlier, which is actually the question about, well, give me um, films together with the nations where they were shot and the population count of these nations. So, I believe I'm out of time. Uh, so I'll stop here. Thank you very much for your attention, and if you have any questions, just let me know, please. Thank you. Now, some people were here this morning, so they, we already discussed a lot there, so... <laughs> Maybe I have one. Uh, somewhere you said that uh, you don't want to solve the general AI problem. Mm -hmm. And after that, you mentioned that you're not solving either the grounding problem. Mm -hmm. But a bit later, you said that you describe meaning indirectly to its effects. Mm -hmm. Is that effect related to causality? Is it causality the lowest level of abstraction or no abstraction? And isn't that the same as solving the grounding problem? I, I, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm getting dragged on philosophical ground here, so I need to be very careful because it's not <laughs> I'm an engineer. No, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. And let's just say, right? Um, uh, it, it's getting it's difficult to run from. So, but uh, let, let me try to say a few things here, which, which, which come into uh, uh, If anybody wants to contradict me because he has more knowledge about these matters, then please do by all means. Um, so, uh, the the effect I'm talking about is not is not causality. Uh, I don't think it is. Um, the I would say that. Um, uh, inferring from from the pieces of knowledge that uh, uh, the Pope lives in Rome and Rome is in Italy, inferring from this that the Pope actually lives in Italy is not causality, right? Uh, so there, there's there's two perspectives. I, I I tend to talk about the effects the integration of, of information has, uh, and the main reason I'm doing this, kind of talk about it in a dynamic sense. Uh, because my experience, being a mathematician, is that if I, if I present it in a dynamic way, then that's more easily accessible to computer scientists. <laughs> because they think of, you give it to get output. But I think uh, the, the, the other way of looking at it is, this is really something static. Uh, logical knowledge representation is static. You have static knowledge. You just have other knowledge which is by necessity also true from what you have. It does not become true once you do the reasoning. It is already there, right? It might just not be exposed. So from that perspective, right? But uh, I don't know if you have a different perspective from causality here. Or... But you also just use the yeah. word true. How do you define true in your information or your meaning mm -hmm. if you're not at the causality? Um, right. Um, that is easier, okay? Uh, it is easier because in the technical context in which we're discussing this, meaning you want to solve problems, um, it's, it's much easier to, to deal with the question what's true and what's not. Uh, because we essentially just say, well, we use a formal semantics which defines 
what follows by necessity from previous knowledge. We do not suggest that this is a general principle which holds for the universe. We're just saying this is how we define it. And if you want to use the data, just stick to that, if you like it or not. Right? So it's a little bit like doing mathematics. Um, in a sense, well, you can think about the philosophy of mathematics from the question of what kind of mathematical truth uh, of, of mathematical knowledge actually corresponds to whatever reality, right? Or not, uh, and say, well, we need to stay constructionist, constructivist, which is we need to <coughs> reject uh, the, the third choice and stuff like that. But in the end, for the everyday mathematician who wants to solve a problem, he makes assumptions, and he derives something from these assumptions by using mechanisms which are uh, not universal truth, right? But which are agreed upon as valid methods by the mathematician's community, right? So it's all interpersonal truth, right? And here it's, it's in the formal semantics. Formal semantics tells you what happens if you join two pieces of information Namely, what new truth emerges from that? Uh, but it's the formal semantics which does that. But mathematics mm -hmm. are grounded on very basic axioms. Really? Starting from piano. Yes. Not are you a mathematician? Are you a mathematician? No, I'm, <laughs> I'm an engineer. What right? about the axiom of choice? The, right? the axiom of choice. Uh, if you, if you dig a little bit deeper in the question on what, on what principles is mathematics grounded, then you very quickly uh, end up with, with the question whether certain assumptions should hold in mathematics or not. And then you actually find, it, for everyday mathematics, it doesn't make a difference. And for application systems, for application developers, it usually doesn't make a difference either because their problems are not deep mathematical problems. But if you ask about the foundations of mathematical truth, then you find pieces of knowledge which are provably neither true nor false on the assumption of what's usually considered to be basic truth among all mathematicians. And then if you analyze how mathematicians work with that, then you notice that some people use it, some people don't. And in some cases, like for the axiom of choice, which is one of these things which you can do mathematics with or without, it actually turns out that there are uh, several different equivalent formulations, some of which, at least for me, are evidently truth, which we should assume, use as a basic assumption for doing mathematics. And if I use an equivalent formulation, then my mathematical intuition tells me I definitely don't want to assume this, because it looks completely nonsense, the well-ordering principle. So, Except when you use the right. web. So, so? Except that when you use the web, you have no idea of which hypothesis are behind it or not in your semantics. You do, as an no, expert. No, yeah, but, yeah, but that, that's, the that doesn't matter. The web who tries to find this has no idea of where the answer is coming from and what are the hypotheses. If, if I remember to uh, Let's put it that way, right? Um, I put on the web um, uh, pieces of news and where they are located, which cities they are located. I put on the web as well um, a list of places and which countries they are in. And with the whole thing, I also publish uh, how to derive well, a general rule which says, under my assumptions, dealing with this piece of knowledge, I tell you that from this you can always derive in which country this piece of news is located. Yeah? I put it out like that, and then the formal semantics of the language uh, tells people how to deal with that and how to infer new pieces of knowledge from this. Then the biggest problem is this ambiguation of your question. If I ask for news from Paris, how do I know if I get Paris, Texas or Paris, France? Oh yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. I mean, we have these problems. Yeah, certainly. Certainly. But how do I know? When you ask me, give me news from Paris, how would I know? 
I would, I would come back to you and say, uh, specify, please. <laughs> yeah. Right. You need to do the same on the web, right? And the difference is that, that in our communication, uh, I might be able to infer what you mean from the communication context. For example, we might be in Texas, it's somewhere in the vicinity of Paris, Texas. And then you ask me, what actually happened recently in Texas? I don't have to ask for this evaluation, right? But I don't have to ask for this evaluation because I have background knowledge and I understand the context and we share a reality. Uh, and on the web, we can't do this, right? I'm saying we're not attempting to give the web a human-like ability. We're trying to model some of that, the simple parts of it, because that already helps for technological solutions. That already gives an added value uh, to company, to application developers. So obviously, the interesting question is how far can we push it? My feeling is we probably cannot push it too far. Uh, but to side cat Hayes, uh, a little semantics goes a long way. <laughs> On the semantics. Okay. Yeah, okay, so. If I, if I put the question from yeah. a different. Okay, yeah, yeah, please do. I find this very exciting. I started from saying that you had to go down to, find, to solve the grunting problem, mm -hmm. and I thought that you were going to uh, causality. Mm -hmm. But it's clear that, in fact, you're going up in abstraction because you're going to a, an upper level Ooh. ontology. That's the same as using these URI, which are in fact putting a, look, a higher level of abstraction on everything to try to merge the similar uh, uh, meanings. Yes, yes, now, yes. Do you yeah, really yeah. think that you can get closer to solving the grounding problems by going up in abstraction? I'm just not trying to solve the problem. You're not trying to solve no, the problem. You are trying to solve the I'm not trying to solve the problem. I'm not trying to solve the problem. I'm not trying to solve the problem. I'm trying to find the right techniques to are. Use it, which, which are helpful for some things. Right? Um, um, I can understand that. Right? And I mean, here, here's our problem different. They're probably semantic web payoff. Um, and uh, put on whatever other hat. Uh, is driving me sometimes. Um, I was saying we're we're not trying. We, the many web community, is not trying to solve the general AI problem, artificial general intelligence problem. In a sense, I am. Okay. <laughs> I just know I won't get there. Okay. But um, uh, why did I come from? This is not a personal statement, right? But why did I come from mathematics to to AI to computer science to to cognitive science? Because at some stage you just got hooked up on the question, how can you actually uh, mathematically model, not computational, but original, mathematically model human thinking? <coughs> From that perspective, I'm probably a cognitive scientist, <laughs> right? Uh, so I find this completely fascinating, yeah? And uh, I agree, I agree that um, good old-fashioned AI um, Meaning, the good old-fashioned AI in the sense they are not trying to solve the general AI problem. They are trying to do incremental steps which uh, realize systems which have ever more powerful abilities which in some sense uh, in five years will solve tasks which right now only humans can do. Okay, this is good old-fashioned AI. Uh, that what they are doing is still steps towards solving the general AI problem. And in fact, I think so because they're accumulating a body of knowledge, of techniques, which in the end might not be useful for implementing an AI, but will to contribute to the body of knowledge which we will probably need at some stage, that some stage have critical mass and there will be a snip, and we'll know how to do it. And uh, I don't think it will be as easy as having more computational power like that. <laughs> okay. So from that perspective, I'm not trying to solve it, right? Um, but uh, but uh, you could say yes. I mean, in a sense, knowledge representation in AI is trying to solve it by say by circumventing it somehow. <coughs> but it's, it's trying to, to but, do something. But how, so my, how, my, how my questions are huh? saying if if we know that to solve that to solve the uh, AI problem, mm -hmm. we have to solve the grounding problem, mm -hmm. and that's going down to causality. Mm -hmm. How do you expect that 
going to a higher level of abstraction will help you to find causality. It doesn't. I believe it will help you with information. Okay. But then why goes that way? <laughs> I believe. Okay, now here's the other perspective. And this is, and, this is, and then I'll, uh, I mean, this is, this is like uh, no, no objections here. Um, uh, brings it back to something I said in the very beginning, right? Here's a semantic web vision, and then maybe in a sense you can say you want to do intelligent information equation for whatever for whatever purpose. Intelligence uh, is a very big word. I know. <laughs> whatever you mean with that, all right? Okay, but uh, um no, no, no. As a semantic writer, I say, no, we don't, we don't want to do that. We want to just do something which is better than what we have right now. Okay? Now, I certainly want to do the human life, but uh, I probably won't get there. Uh, so, um, uh, now we need methods which work. Okay? And uh, the semantic web community is, is driven, um, uh, as so often, right, by a relatively short attention span. Project funding. Yeah. Uh, you're talking about um, setting out 10 years ago, and it has taken too long to actually do something realizable. So you're not trying to solve the grounding problem. Although what you're trying to do might do a few steps there. Uh, you're not trying to solve, to find the best possible approach to address these issues, which might be going down with whatever means. And uh, I'm completely sympathetic to this idea. Um, in fact, my, my co-author, uh, my, my co-editor in chief, Simon Electron, Christopher Piano, which is a geoscientist, uh, he looks at things very much from that perspective. Has a lot of interesting discussions with him. Uh, but the problem is that um, I understand the conceptual idea behind it. Uh, I share it as, as an alternative uh, to the extent to which I understand it. However, um, show me works. Right? And it's probably much further away from working than we are where we currently are with the old school knowledge representation approaches which you're following. And it's exactly for this reason that uh, in the very beginning I said semantic web is not about doing modeling with ontologies or with standardized ontology languages. This is just what happened because it seemed to be the appropriate steps at the time. Semantic web is about solving this problem of intelligent information integration. And not even necessarily on the web, because the problems are the same everywhere else. Right? And uh, if, if some alternative ideas come forth, how to do that, right? then I'm just happy. I'm happy. Uh, probably most of the community won't, because uh, most of their work will be obsolete. <laughs> right? <laughs> but I would be happy. Yeah? So, uh, Make sense? Yeah. <laughs> okay. And thanks for this time. Sure. Yeah. I, 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 I appreciate that. So, so it's fine. Yeah. Any more things I can answer? In the last uh, slides of your presentation, you show a table of experiments on ontology alignments. Yeah. So, so which methodology you have used to, uh, to align the ontology? Uh, are you compared the, the whole ontology to other ontologies or some concepts uh, from one ontology to another ontology? And what methods you have used to, to, uh, to do this uh, alignment? Have you used the basic resources such as uh, WebNet or other methods? Um, it's a, it's, it's a, well, okay, now this, this system here uh, was based on a completely new idea by, by the PhD student, Katik Jain, there. And uh, uh, he was basically departing from 10 years of, of ontology and library research because he, had, he didn't know about it, because he was actually working on query. And then we came up with this approach, and then we noticed we need to solve this ontology and library problem, and he said, I actually have an idea how this could work. Um, which was, uh, and then he told me that, and then I told him, I, I don't think that's uh, for some reason, which I had. Uh, he said, I do believe it works. And I okay, try it, right? And he came up with these results. So uh, it's sometimes good to not have background knowledge in your research area because you have fresh ideas. That's probably one of the reasons why we appreciate thoughts of PhD students so much, because we're so much into the stuff, it's very difficult sometimes for us to have a creative thought. Anyway, the idea he had was to uh, was was something which which was not tried, has been had not been tried before. The traditional methods here do something like um, 
Uh, they look at the names of the entities and, and do some matching with pseudonyms and with WordNet and string similarity, these kind of things, probably some structural things, uh, kind of what, what are the properties of an entity, the properties of an entity, other ontologies such that it's likely to match them, these kind of things. And what he did was uh, he uh, essentially said, well, there's two terms you want to match. Uh, he posts a query to Wikipedia for each of these terms, um, just the usual string search. Uh, for each term, he gets back a set of Wikipedia pages. Um, each Wikipedia page is assigned to a so-called Wikipedia category. That's not a class hierarchy, but at least you have a category hierarchy, which is very messy. And then he analyzes the, the category trees, um, uh, which these Wikipedia pages he's found. So he finds a forest, right? Because he gets many Wikipedia pages. For each thing, he gets a forest. And then he compares these forests. And based on this comparison, uh, he makes a decision whether we make an alignment between two terms or not. And I didn't believe in the beginning, sorry. Okay, let me show you that we can kind of double precision recall with the most competitive system. So this is the approach he was, he was using. We call this general idea in the meantime, we call it, um, uh, we call it uh, linked data bootstrapping. So essentially, we're, we're using data which is out there, which is very messy, and we bootstrap this data to get cleaner data okay, with some of these methods, which essentially you could say it's a kind of statistical analysis, right? just that we're not using statistics. Yeah? Uh, but we're looking at, at lots of hits we have out there, all is noisy and so on, and then we filter out the good hits. I really think he has an excellent idea. Okay. Okay. <coughs> okay. Any more questions? Any more questions? We can continue with uh, some wine and cheese outside. Excellent. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.